Hey everybody, nice to be here with you. So when I was asked to talk about workforce, um, you know, the obvious thing would be to talk about how clients are using our software to do more, and I will talk a little bit about that. But before uh, that, there's an important, there's some really important things that I that I have seen clients do or shops do uh, that are having a lot of success with with recruiting and retaining. So I'm gonna spend a good portion of the time actually just talking about that. It's not software related at all, but I think they're principles that really matter to understand and know about. Um, but before I actually get into that, let's see if this thing, oh, there we go. There we go, a little bit of delay. As I was prepping for this, I realized that it was exactly eight years ago at this conference that we launched ProShop to the world. We didn't exist as a software company before then, so yeah, that was our booth, uh, what we could afford at the time. So this is kind of like homecoming for us. This community has been incredibly supportive, has been just cheering us on ever since we launched the company. There was four of us that came over after we sold our shop, and now there's uh, over 90 people and over 500 clients in 13 countries. So it's been quite a wild ride for the last eight years, so I just really appreciate Thank you. Um, just the support of this aerospace community, it really does feel like home to us. So, show of hands, how many of your companies have current job openings that you are trying to hire for? Almost everyone. And how many are having incredible results right now? Keep your hands up if you're having amazing results. There's like two hands. So I'm guessing, uh, you could use a sign like this outside your building. I actually took this picture a couple of weeks ago when I was visiting a shop in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this company is desperate for pretty much every position in their company. Uh, multiples of most positions, as you can see there, although the sharp-eyed will notice that they only apparently need one machinist. Um, I'm suspecting that they probably need more than that, given how many machines I saw in there. And it is just as bad online. As I was prepping for this, I went on Indeed, and I looked for, I mean, you can use machinist as just an example for my talk here. Started looking for machinists and, and operators, and there's just a lot of ads out there right now. Thousands of positions open. And so the challenge is having your job ad even get found. So I'm gonna ask you to do that. You can do this now, or you can do this later. Pull out your phone, go to the job listing site that you use, your company uses, and try to find your own ad not using your company's name. Just search whatever keywords, machinist, welder, whatever it might be, and see if you can even find it. And if you can find it, it's probably going to be pretty bland with some obscure requirements, not obscure to you, I know they matter to you, but something that is not going to catch the attention of someone that's actually looking for a job. Someone that might be in a job today that they don't actually love that much. They go to work, they do their thing. It's not really inspiring to them. It may not be a career path. But they get out there, they do their best. But the whole, all the while, they were wishing they could find something that they loved and that aligned with their values, aligned with their skills, like mechanical aptitude, troubleshooting, technical skills, attention to detail. And they want to find a company to do that that aligns with their values. All the while, those jobs exist by the thousands, but there's just a mismatch. The seekers are here, the hirers are down here, and they're just not connecting. And a lot of it is because uh, they can't find you. So there's this misalignment. And uh, as an aside, the Pacific Northwest Aerospace Cluster that Peter is leading up is trying to help bridge this as well. So definitely talk to him about that if you uh, want to see what they're up to. So one of the ways that you can actually make that connection better is to learn from your current employees about why they're there at your company. Why do they come every day? Why do they love it? What makes them stay? What are their hobbies? What are their interests? What do their friends do that they you know, also work, uh, you know, that they, they connect with? And try to get in their heads so you can better understand the same type of people that you want to attract. Who here, again, show of hands, is familiar with the Myers-Briggs personality profile system? Pretty much everyone, I assume that much. 
Uh, keep your hand up if you know which of these 16 types typically makes the best machinist. Great, not a single one. I was going to give away a t-shirt to someone that knew that, but um, this one, the ISTP, um, which I happen to be, I think, although my wife says I'm more of an ESTJ these days, but we won't get into that. Um, but ISTPs, by their nature and their strengths, make great machinists. They are, they are good with technical skills, they like detail, they like working uh, independently. And so the point I'm getting to is if you understand the people that are currently strong in those roles today in your company, and you understand the types, and there's types for all different roles in the company. There's different types that would be really great buyers, or really great estimators, or really great in finance, whatever it might be. So understand those, and then write job ads that are just really gonna be compelling to those types of people. Would this job ad be more likely to get a click by one of those people that uh, might be a great machinist? I sure as heck believe they would. So this is much more likely to stand out, and they're gonna, you're gonna attract someone that is, not only has those skills, but probably is looking for someone, a company that has the values that they care about. I know in our own job ads, you know, and we've hired 70 people in the last three or four years, we put, we put some of our core values, including kindness, right in the job listing, right in that front section. And that attracts people that care about kindness. Speaking of values, as I was doing my research for this, I uh, ran across this thing from LinkedIn. Feel free to take a picture of this. Uh, smart companies are recognizing the importance of leading with their values. Because these new generations, Gen Zers, uh, Millennials, they care a lot about these things. I think even more than, than um, many in previous generations. All right, let's move to onboarding. So you've, hopefully you've found someone that's going to align with uh, your values and has the, at least the interest to do the job you need to do. And you have got to make that onboarding exceptional. Can I see another show of hands about any companies where someone got hired, they came for a day or two, and then they just disappeared? Yeah, fair number, right? And I believe it's because your onboarding experience is not good enough. So without that great first experience, it's you will, that old saying, you only have one chance to, to leave a first impression, right? So that first day, first week should feel like a big old hug. They should have, you should essentially have a process, and hopefully it's just innately in your culture, where everyone is welcomed and the team is excited that they're there and thanks them for joining the company and excited to learn and teach, from, you know, teach, teach them and learn from them and sort of continue to build your company and culture together. And if you can provide that, that's gonna create the impact that's gonna keep them there for at least that, that first week or second or third, and, and hopefully you just really got them for a long time. As I was, was, I was uh, prepping for this again and doing some research, I ran across a crazy statistic that nine in 10 Gen Zers and Millennials say they would leave a job to go work for another company that better aligned with their values. Nine out of 10, just on values alone. So if you're not leading with that, you are fighting a losing battle. So consider that. Now here's an anecdote, uh, take it for what it's worth. Uh, on my podcast, Machine Shop Mastery, I interview owners of successful shops. And I originally didn't think it was gonna be that much about values, but as my mother-in-law who's here, who listens to every episode, will tell you she finds it fascinating because we get into values. And I don't know if there's correlation or causality, but these shops that are highly successful all talk about their values all the time. So I think it's important. So again, consider that as well. All right, we're gonna change now to actually getting some work done, the sort of meat and potatoes. So every day, people come to your workplace and you pay them to do wasteful things. All day long, guaranteed. And that's the opposite of doing more with less. That's doing less with more. I don't know what that is. 
So as a fundamental concept, we have to get rid of the waste in our companies. And there's some things like Kaizen and value stream mapping and some just general good lean practices that can be employed. And I think that's just as important as cultural as core values and culture is to build that, that culture of continuous improvement. This is a uh, picture from my old shop. Um, Kelsey, my partner on the left, Brian, who's here today on our team, is there without a beard, uh, and some of the other guys looking very young and fresh-faced. And we did value stream mapping, and we did Kaizen events, and we focused deeply on this stuff. We did thousands of Kaizen improvement activities over the years, and it made a huge difference in our efficiency, a huge difference in our throughput, our profitability. And now in the position that I'm in today, I have the privilege of looking pretty deep inside of hundreds of shops. And the difference between those that have continuous improvement as a mindset and those that don't is a very stark contrast. And one of the biggest measures that we see is how, how much labor it takes to do a given thing. So we have shops that are about equal in size, call it a $10 million shop doing contract manufacturing with 50% repeat work and 50% new work. And in some of those companies, it takes like four or five people in their procurement departments. And in other companies, it takes one person. And they're buying the same amount of stuff and they're doing the same things, but the difference in the effort is just monumental. So, and of course, after they put ProShop in, it gets even better and it's faster and more smooth, but fundamentally, just looking at it from a waste perspective, there's so much work to be done there. All right. So, I would implore you to, this is one of our, our, our Kaizen tags that we had in our office Kaizen team. So teach your team about the waste, encourage them to document them, have a team that regularly works through those improvement activities and just start doing it. Don't wait, don't make it super formalized necessarily, but you gotta get the buy-in and you gotta do it. And then celebrate those wins. Have those pizza parties that you put in your job ad every month and celebrate and give out bonuses for the great waste that people are, uh, are eliminating. I've talked to a number of folks at the conference this week about tribal knowledge. And I ask them how it is in their company and I usually get an eye roll oh, and a deep sigh because they know, and you all know, your companies are rife with it. There is so much tribal knowledge. It's really difficult. Um, I was at a client a couple of weeks ago down in Oklahoma and there was a part number that uh, they've done for years and for most of those years it was known as the Jimmy casting because Jimmy was the only one that could possibly set that job up and run it without scrapping a whole bunch of them. And that's a dangerous place to be because if Jimmy goes on vacation or if Jimmy decides to leave the company there's no one that can figure out how to make that part. Now, they documented the heck out of it. They made it so that, and he said, like they had a new employee and like his second week on the job, he ran the Jimmy casting. It's still known as the Jimmy casting forevermore, but uh, Bob or Mary, whoever, can now run that successfully. And it's really dangerous to have this level of tribal knowledge. Doug Ackerman from Boeing, when he was talking, he talked about how some of the most risky things, the things that introduce waste, or not waste, you know, errors and mistakes and scrap into the system is change events, right? The ch moving, moving a work statement to another shop, moving from one work cell to another, work, you know, moving from a, an operator that really knows a process to one that doesn't. The reason they're risky is because of tribal knowledge. So if you can eliminate that, that reduces all sorts of waste that helps you do more with less. Now we're getting to the ProShop screenshots, my favorite part. So this is a page where you can document the entire process uh, and history of improvement activities, of troubleshooting, of uh, opportunities in a way that allows it to be captured, assigned to people, assign potential solutions, track the status, 
And whether you use a system like ProShop or you use spreadsheets or something, even just the concept of having a page like this is so critical to have a full history of what you've done on a part over time. How have you made those improvements? What were some of the problems you troubleshoot last time that you might be able to look back and see how you solve that? So creating a system like this is immensely important. And while we're talking about documenting processes, it is absolutely essential from the very highest level with a company position like this or your quality manual all the way down to the low level part numbers. When a franchisee opens a brand new McDonald's, they do not try to figure out how to run a McDonald's. There is a playbook. It is documented. They follow the playbook and they can run it and make, make the burgers just like, you know, the one uh, the next town over. And we need that same type of process, that same type of documentation, that same type of repeatable, scalable process in our businesses. And no offense to McDonald's, but building precision aerospace parts is a hundred thousand times more complex as, as flipping a burger. But we're often asking people to do that without nearly the level of documentation that it really should have. So here's an example of a part number operation level work instruction with videos and photos and rich text and, and the things that makes the Jimmy casting be able to get run by anybody. But let's please not document everything on paper. Can we all agree on that at least? This picture gives me nightmares. This is an absolute disaster waiting to happen. This was taken at a client of ours before they went to Pro Shop. I mean, look at this thing. This, if this gets lost, the fact that you have to use gloves, use gloves, use gloves. I think they want you to wear gloves when you're holding these things. But that's not even the scariest. This note here, uh, run the holes on the high side of the tolerance. That is scary, people. Like, what happens if this traveler gets lost and someone makes the holes on the small side of the tolerance? And then it goes to plating, and the plating fills up the holes, and it's out of tolerance. And then, oh, darn it, now we've got to strip them and rebore them or mill them out or scrap them. Or... It's so wasteful, and it's the opposite of doing more with less. So just getting rid of this kind of stuff is uh, just so, so, so important for getting the most out of your people. And our industry has to just do better with that. All right, let's move and talk a little bit about quality for a minute. So, and I swear I had all these slides before Doug's talk on Tuesday. Lisa will tell you I handed them in, but I just, when, I, when he was talking, I'm like, oh yeah, this is fantastic. So, the ability to maintain quality, maintain process control, to be able to keep on top of things and not let, you know, waste or scrap happen is just so, so critical. So, with paper forms, you can't really do that, right? If people are filling in the results of what they're running. How many of you heard, I know I have heard of situations where a machinist is running parts and they're writing down a dimension they think is intolerance, but they misunderstood the tolerance because it's plus plus or plus minus asymmetric amounts. And they're writing down bad results all day long making parts. It's a terrible result, but it happens. So this is fundamentally important to the supply chain, you know, and ultimately with things like NetInspect, um, we want to be able to take our first article inspection data and with a single click, you know, upload it right into NetInspect. Now, another anecdote here, we had a, uh, a client defense contractor in Texas that makes very complex assemblies. They make the, the whole upright and base plate thing that goes on a, on a ship that holds the missiles that, that launch. So deep bombs, super complex. They had a lady whose job was 100% full-time just preparing document packages. You guys probably employ people like this yourselves in your companies. Her document packages, depending on the complexity of the part, could take six hours, could take 20 hours. After, they re after she realized that her job using ProShop is condensed to clicking one button that anyone could do, the president found her in her office crying, figuring she was going to get fired. But instead of doing that, he gave her a position as a full-on quality engineer, helping build the quality plan in the first place, 
make sure they're focusing on the right things, reducing scrap, making processes more stable. So that was a fantastic outcome that, again, doing more with less. You didn't need a full-time wage just preparing documents. One click it pulls everything in together. They told us in a case study we did that it saved them 96% of the time. That was their average improvement. And then at the end, one click, sync to NetInspect, and we're on our way. So a great example of doing more with less. And one of the benefits of being able to have a digital quality and inspection process is the ability to reduce scrap. And that can be done by making the process of creating NCRs and corrective actions so lightweight that they're virtually no cost. And the importance of that is that when you don't create NCRs as frequently, because, because creating an NCR is not a good thing, you, you miss out on the process improvement side of doing that. So if you can make the transactional cost almost free and have things like, you know, when the, when the dimension is recorded out of tolerance, it spawns a, an alert. It spawns, you know, notifications to a quality team. They can come and do an MRB process very quickly, right in the moment, record the process improvement, fix it, and move on without creating a whole bunch of scrap. And that lady from Texas can be involved in that part of it to make the process stronger, as opposed to just pushing papers. All right, let's move for a minute and talk about just spindle time and throughput. Uh, for anyone that listens to the Making Chips podcast, their saying is, if you're not making chips, you're not making money, right? And that's true. And so we should endeavor to reduce the time from when your last job comes off to when your next job you know, is, is bought off and you're running good parts. And so trying to maximize that spindle time, reduce that downtime is so essential. So taking as much of the setup as possible and making it offline, this whole concept of SMED, single minute exchange of dies, uh, is kind of the importance here. And it's not a complex process. I mean, there's a, a caddy of tools, um, touched off, ready to go. We might have some fixtures. We have our packaging materials in the bottom. We have our box labels. Everything we need so you can wheel up a cart, load it all in the machine, and you know, hit go with your proven G code as fast as possible. But having a process to support that, a digital process, is also really important. So we think that checklists are a, a fantastic way to do that. So this is a process where you can basically uh, assign out tasks. You can see them here. They're color-coded um, to make sure you're pulling, that, pulling as much of the, of the setup from internal to the machine to external as possible. Just a fundamentally important lean concept to, to, uh, to take note of. All right. Now let's duck. And when you do that, it is fully possible to reduce your average setup times by 50% or more. That is the number we hear our clients talk about all the time, is 50% reduction. And that's not, just, that's not a software feature. That is just them doing that work. And we guide them to do that work and, tr and train as that is a best practice. Speaking of training, let's talk about training here. None of this that I just described is going to happen without training. So it's imperative to give people the training they need to be successful in the jobs they are in, and you want them to go in in the future. So uh, there are lots of good programs out there. For technical skills, there's NIMS, there's Tooling U, there's NTMAU, there's Titans of CNC Academy, uh, there's AJAC, of course, here locally. So align your company with one of those programs, teach those technical skills, and then document those, uh, you know, right into your system. We think there's, you know, sort of killing two birds with one stone, having really good documentation that that your employees can see. And they can ins you can inspire them to you know move up the chain, see what's next, what training they need to go get in order to you know get a get more pay as a setup machinist or as a lead or as ultimately a manufacturing manager, who knows where. But those go getters, when they can see the path, it's amazing how inspired they can be to uh, to move and um, you know make moves in your company and become more valuable to to, the, to your company. I would be remiss if we didn't talk about automation although I only have truly just a couple of token slides because that's a talk for a, a different day. Um, and everyone knows automation is important. And it's both the most expensive, right? 
I also took this picture a couple of weeks ago at that same shop in, in Tulsa. You know, they had a nice Morisiki lathe, put a robot on it, and got vastly more throughput, you know, three times more throughput than their other lathes that didn't have a robot. So if you're sitting on the fence about whether you should automate your equipment, hands down, it's just such a good idea. And of course, talking about setup time, and if you don't have to set up at all, you have systems like this is also taken at a client, the most beautiful shop I've ever seen in my life, Roush Yates Manufacturing Solutions, makers of the Roush Yates uh, NASCAR engines. Fun fact, it was not on my slides, 40% of the components in a Ford NASCAR engine are managed in ProShop. I love as a, as, a, as a motorhead, I love that fact so much. Um, but again, if, if everyone had a you know, million dollars to drop or a couple on these machines, they would. But that's the ultimate in throughput. So in conclusion, you got to get creative with your recruiting. Get people to actually come in the door, not just bypass your ad and go look at one of the other hundreds that are on that page. You've got to hook them with a great onboarding process so they stay, you get an opportunity to really, you know, get into your culture, which you know is probably great. That's why you have uh, enduring companies today. And then once they're in there, you've got to eliminate waste and focus on efficiency. And of course, we think ProShop is a great tool for that, but there's so many other ways without spending a penny. And ultimately, you do those things, you're going to do more with less. And I decided to throw this slide in there. I asked ChatGPT to make me a picture of a bunch of people cheering as an airplane goes soaring overhead. And we were talking about you know, airplane efficiencies and fuel reduction. I think the solution is to only use three engines for those <laughs> double aisles. It's been right under our wings the whole time. That's the answer. So, so, so Boeing and Airbus are in here. Feel free to use my idea. I won't ask for any royalties. But the reason that this is important is that, as we've heard this week, the opportunities right now are massive. There is so much opportunity in the supply chain. We need thousands of airplanes going out into decades from now. And our industry needs to step up. It, you know, our, these individual shops that you run need to be able to find the people, attract them, bring them into the industry. They're going to love it. We all know how passionate we are. That passion can be brought onto them. And as far as like the foundation of our economy, you know, anyone that follows me on LinkedIn knows I'm passionate about this. I have the whole thank a machinist hashtag. Machine shops are the foundation of the entire economy and all the other businesses that support that, welders and fabricators. We just can't get anything built in the world without us. So it's important to do that, do more with less, bring those people in. Thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate you listening to me.